Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can contact him directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. All right, just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. And this is an upcoming event that you can find more information here, also on our website. And we do offer advertising, so you can contact Bean with the email on your screen for more information. And our webinar today is sponsored by AccuTrack. Here's a short message from them. AccuTrack Consulting and Accounting Services is an 8A WOSB CPA firm committed to supporting entities sustain growth in government contracting. Our outstanding DCAA accounting solutions reduce audit risk, improve cash flows, and give you peace of mind. Contact us today to learn how we can enhance your DCAA accounting efforts. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Christoph Minarchek, and he's going to be covering deep dive into other transaction authorities. Uh, Christoph, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Mallory, and good morning, good afternoon, and hello to everybody out there tuning in for this webinar. We're going to go into a deep dive into other transactions and other transaction authority. My name is Christoph Minarczyk. I'm the owner of ChristophLLC.com, providing expert advice in government contracts, including consulting, expert witness services, and professional instruction. My background in other transactions started sometime in 2015 when I published an article with NCMA with my colleague Jason Myers. And this was a 101 frequently asked questions type of article about other transactions. And you can get a copy of that full length article from me. I'd be happy to send it to you if you email me at Christoph at ChristophLLC.com. And my further background in other transactions is that as a consultant to many different federal contractors, some of them indeed participate in other transactions. And then one of my largest clients is a government agency that is probably the most experienced in other transactions within the Department of Defense. So I have a great deal of um, professional experience and knowledge about other transactions, and I'm going to do my best to give you just a little taste of that in this short 20-minute presentation. So, quick overview of other transaction authority. What is it? Well, it's defined in the negative. In other transaction is not a traditional government contract subject to the FAR. It is not a grant, and it is not a cooperative agreement. In other transaction is something else. It's defined in the negative which can be difficult. The reason that Congress created other transaction authority is specifically to avoid the traditional rules, regulations, and laws subject to traditional government contracts, such as the Federal Acquisition Regulation. It all started with NASA. NASA got special authority under the Space Act of 1958 in response to the Soviet threat in the space race. This special authority allowed for what they called Space Act agreements. And out of those Space Act agreements, which were not subject to the traditional rules of government contracts, we now have other transaction authority, which spread from NASA into other federal agencies, such as the Department of Defense. And we now call it other transaction authority for the law the rules that allow us to use this um, special type of government industry agreement. And then we have other transactions or OTs. Those would be the contracts themselves. Now, something to understand, just because it's not a traditional government contract doesn't mean that an other transaction isn't a legally binding instrument. In other words, a contract. And in fact, you should remember that because 
don't get confused just because the other transaction is not required to follow the FAR and is not a traditional government contract doesn't mean that it's not like normal contracts that you enter into all the time with other businesses. For instance, if you, the government contractor, enter into a contract with Christoph LLC for consulting services, we would have a great deal of freedom. We could write that contract in many, many different ways. We would not have to follow the rules of the FAR because neither of us is the federal government. We would have a great amount of freedom of contract. Well, that freedom of contract applies the same to other transactions between you, the federal contractor, and the government agency. So you should take advantage of that and you should understand that you don't have to follow some special template. Even if the government provides you a template or a starting point, always remember another transaction is not a FAR-based contract and you have the greatest ability to negotiate and to write and edit and change terms that you would not otherwise be able to do in a government contract. That is, in fact, the purpose of other transactions. That is, in fact, one of the main benefits of other transactions. Most people agree the three main benefits of an other transaction, as opposed to a traditional government contract, would be that other transactions do not have to follow the FAR and other standard government contracting laws and regulations. They do not have to follow the cost accounting standards, the onerous accounting rules. And finally, they do not have to follow the intellectual property rules, regulations, and laws, such as the Buy Dole Act, that would otherwise apply to government contracts. These are all tremendously valuable benefits of another transaction. Now, what do we use to buy or what do we buy with other transactions? Primarily, cutting edge research and development and the prototypes associated with that. The prototypes would just be kind of like a proof of concept, a system, a model, some sort of tangible exercise of the underlying technology, which could later potentially go into production or mass production, um, you know, manufacturing and such. But Remember that that's mostly in the Department of Defense that you're limited to that. Other agencies have much broader ability to buy things with other transaction authority. And also keep in mind that the laws surrounding other transaction authority are constantly in flux. Every year in the past few years, the National Defense Authorization Act has had provisions that change significantly other transaction authority, and there is great interest in it. And that's something we're going to go over later. First, I want to move to the next slide about protests and litigation. What is the legal forum? What are the rules about protests on other transactions? If you lose an other transaction competition, can you protest as you would a normal government contract to the Government Accountability Office, the GAO? Well, the answer is generally no, because other transactions are not subject to many of the laws and regulations that apply to normal government contracts. So that includes the Contract Disputes Act. That includes the Bayh-Dole Act. And then for the purposes of protests, other transactions are not subject to the Competition in Contracting Act, or CICA, C-I-C-A. That is the law that requires full and open competition for all government contracts, unless you have an exception. And that law is the basis of the jurisdiction for the GAO to hear bid protests. The GAO is a legislative agency. That might surprise you. The GAO is not in the executive branch. It is, in fact, a legislative agency. It is an arm of Congress. The GAO is there to make sure that federal agencies spend the money that Congress gives them correctly. Now, a bid protest is your way, the federal contractor's way of ensuring that the government spends that money correctly according to the rules. And some of those rules would be the FAR or the Competition and Contracting Act. But none of those rules apply to other transactions, which is why you will be hard pressed to find that many GAO protests concerning other transactions. However, there are some, and let me explain how that works. 
So again, generally speaking, the GAO does not have jurisdiction to hear a bid protest about an other transaction, okay? But there is a very important exception. If the government improperly uses other transaction authority, if the government does not follow the law and the policy on using other transactions, then there is a chance for the GAO to have jurisdiction. In such a case, the GAO would say that because the government failed to properly exercise its other transaction authority, this procurement should have been instead conducted using a traditional government contract. And since it should have been conducted using a traditional government contract, but was not conducted using a traditional government contract, in such a case, the GAO would indeed have jurisdiction to hear the bid protest. A recent example of this very, very limited exception to the rule that other transactions are generally not subject to GAO bid protest is exemplified by a very recent GAO protest by Oracle. This is a protest against the Army for follow-on production of cloud services by the Army. And you can find that Oracle uh, bid protest. I don't have the actual B number for the GAO bid protest, but I have that in my file somewhere. If you'd like it, feel free to eat. Email me at Christoph at ChristophLLC.com. I will find it and give it to you. But enough about GAO bid protest. You now understand that the rule is they're not subject to it. However, if the government does the other transaction wrong and they should not have indeed used another transaction, but should have indeed used a normal traditional government contract, well, then maybe the GAO can step in and hear the bid protest like the time that Oracle protested to the GAO successfully about the Army's follow-on production for cloud services improperly using in other transaction. If you don't have that, well, there's not too many options and the field is a little bit wide open. There is not much precedent. There is not much already settled court decisions about how to deal with other transactions and protests and attempts by you, the federal contractor, to stop the ongoing other transaction award to one of your competitors. But one of the recent examples would be Orbital ATK. They sued in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia about DARPA's use of other transactions for a particular project that involved robots floating around in space and uh, repairing satellites. It was called the robotic servicing of geosynchronous satellites. And this happened in 2017. This was a lawsuit, again, not at the GAO. It was in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. And this was a strange one, folks. This is strange and this reflects the lack of legal precedent and forum for someone to protest or do something about other transactions. It's a new field, it's creative but they had to sue in the Eastern District of Virginia. And they basically said that, no, DARPA, you cannot award that contract because it violates United States space policy. Well, that was a creative argument, but it lost. It did not work. Let's move on to the next slide. Congressional interest in other transactions and private sector stakeholders and opinions. I can assure you other transactions are being discussed right now by staffers and other transactions will be featured in the upcoming National Defense Authorization Act. It is a hot topic. And here's how the arguments um, sound on both sides of the issue. Those who like other transactions will tell you that other transactions are absolutely critical. They provide flexibility. They allow the government to deal with private sector companies that would otherwise not do business with the government, and therefore, they are vital to national security. On the other end of the spectrum, there are those who say that other transactions are dangerous because they're so flexible. They're dangerous because they do not protect the taxpayer and they do not protect the government agency because they do not have the training wheels or the default standard FAR clauses and protections and terms and conditions 
that we're used to. So the naysayers would say that there's too much risk, the government is ill-equipped to enter into other transactions, and bad results will happen, while the proponents will say that these are incredibly useful ways to get innovative research and development and prototypes, and it attracts non-traditional contractors, those companies that do not want to do anything with the government, which is a particular concern in the modern day where the share of research and development has shifted incredibly towards the private sector. In the past, the government was the big supplier for dollars for research and development. That is no longer the case. Companies like Apple have cash on hand to buy out completely some of the largest defense contractors. And this is now the source of most research and development, private industry companies. So again, the idea is to use other transactions to get to that technology that we would otherwise not be able to get to because such companies don't want to do business with the government. So that debate rages on, it will continue to rage on, and you should track that with latest updates to legislation, notably the National Defense Authorization Act. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide about the creative structures you can have with these other transaction agreements. The consortium model. The consortium model is controversial, but it is in use right now. Under the consortium model, well, there's, there's many forms of it, but let me give you one form of the consortium model. Uh, it has the federal agency on the one hand, and then in the private sector, there is a collection of several different federal contractors who are all part of participating in this other transaction. These several contractors join together under some sort of articles of collaboration or consortium. And the idea is that for various requirements or needs of the government, each of those consortium members will have the opportunity to perform or quote, win that work. Or another model is that they may participate with one another and they may partner and join together. There are many different versions of this consortium model, but the thing to understand is it's a lot like under major systems, major weapon systems, billion dollar ACAT-1 contracts, where you have a lead system integrator. It's a lot like that. The lead system integrator will be a single company that has a long, gigantic chain of subcontractors below them who are performing most of the work. But the important part is that one contractor is the integrator and is responsible for herding those cats. That's kind of like what a consortium model is. And the consortium might be managed by a nonprofit or maybe some private company. But the point is that there will be some entity, part of the other transaction arrangement, that is managing, administering, organizing another larger set of many different contractors who are all participating perhaps in a certain industry like microelectronics. So you'd have kind of the lead system integrator or the administrator of a consortium of many different microelectronics providers. There are many such other transactions and consortium models out there right now that you can participate in if you're in the right industry. Another creative structuring of other transactions would be the cost share model. In this model, the government determines that cost sharing is appropriate because there's such a business opportunity in the future that the company, you, the private contractor, they'd be willing to shift some of the burden, pay some of the costs, and the government would pay some of the costs. They would split it in some fashion because the idea is the government gets a benefit by creating or directing or manipulating a particular industry, such as the weapons industry. And then the contractor gets an advantage and is willing to pay some of the costs because they will get future business in this industry. So the cost share model is a very popular one in other transactions, since the idea is to open up cutting edge research and development and prototypes in new areas, in new technology. A cost share is one way of achieving that. And then the new industry model is something I touched upon. In this model, the idea is that the government will use another transaction or a series of other transactions 
to literally create a new industry. These are the technologies of the future. We have cell phones, we have lasers, we have radar, but we do not yet have artificial intelligence. We do not yet have a fully matured hypersonics technology industry, although those two areas are growing. They are growing in part due to government investment through other transactions. And again, the idea is to fund industry, provide funding for the research and development for cutting edge technology and industry to create industries that simply didn't exist before. And all of this illustrates, again, the main purpose of why we have other transactions, to get to those non-traditional government contractors or companies that are not government contractors at all. It's to attract them to do business with the government so that the government can tap into the best technology, cutting edge research and development, but not be subject to many of the rules, regulations, and laws that keep those companies away from the government. That's the purpose of other transactions. They provide a great deal of flexibility, and I encourage you to explore them and to seek out new opportunities. If I can ever be of help with that, please email me at Christoph at ChristophLLC.com. And with that, this concludes the presentation, and I'll hand it back over to Mallory. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph, for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Today's presentation has been recorded and can be found on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions about today's topic, please contact Christoph at the phone number or email shown on your screen. Thank you, everybody. This concludes the webinar.